Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of uh, experience in dementia. Uh, my only foray into that area was working on ALS a few years ago, where there was an overlap with a, a region on uh, chromosome 9. So, uh, GMI, or Genomics Medicine in Ireland, uh, I founded this with a couple of VCs uh, back in May 2015. Um, the main idea here was to leverage Ireland's homogeneity or the founder population. So as a, a population, we're probably more like each other than a lot of uh, Western Europe. And the idea was that we would build a world-class disease-specific uh, population uh, genomic database, uh, mainly for discovery. So in 2016, we closed a Series A funding of 40 million. Uh, so it's a VC-backed uh, company, uh, Arch and Polaris, who are two US VCs uh, who happen to have offices in Dublin, uh, Google Ventures out of London, and also the Ireland Strategic Innovation Fund, uh, which is a sovereign fund, our, our old pay pension reserve fund. Um, so the Irish government is behind this, uh, but as a VC and not as a public project. 2017, January, uh, we signed a partnership, 15-year partnership with AbV, uh, investigating certain conditions. And uh, again, this is a, a long-term project, and we see this as uh, central to uh, GMI, uh, with a view to doing some more uh, uh, projects like this. So we also set about to build uh, NGS capability in Ireland, uh, so basically to build out a, a genome centre in Ireland, and uh, we just launched that uh, two weeks ago. So the mission was to build a world-class disease uh, population genomics database, and the idea was that we could power precision medicine research uh, by doing so, and also uh, wellness and care. Our initial objective was to whole genome sequence about 60,000 uh, individuals and to SNP genotype about 100,000 uh, individuals. So the reason we picked 60,000, it's about the, uh, the average birth rate in Ireland. <clears throat> and then with a long-term aim to sequence about 10% of the Irish population. So fairly ambitious, but uh, we have an aim and I'll show you the reasons for that uh, later on. And we've uh, identified roughly uh, 50 disease areas that we're interested in uh, investigating. So the main strategy was uh, pharmaceutical collaborations uh, with a view to uh, new therapeutics. So that's the main driver of the business. Uh, obviously, molecular diagnostic targets will be identified in that process. And, uh, then the, 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 lo the longer term is preventative medicine, so turning the, uh, the model of looking for disease causing variants on its head to look for uh, disease causing or uh, traits that pre uh, are preventative to uh, uh, certain conditions, uh, essentially the wellness element. So, a uh, question, is Ireland in the, the Goldilocks region? So, you know, for Earth to survive, we have this region where it's not too hot or not too cold. And in terms of genomics, we think that Ireland sits somewhere in that region. So we're not too big, not too small, in order to, uh, to carry out a, a national project. And we have the, I think we have the right infrastructure uh, to be able to be successful in this space. So as I said, it's a private company. Um, we, we're leveraging the knowledge of Decode. So um, our, our, our absent guest, uh, Dr. Stephenson, sits on the board. Uh, we also leverage some of the expertise from uh, Nextcode and also from people from uh, Complete Genomics. So the idea here is that it's a difficult area, but not to make the mistakes that a lot of other groups have made, uh, at least to give ourselves a head start uh, in, in carrying out a, uh, a project of this uh, size. 
And we already, in terms of our investment and uh, our, our first deal, uh, we already feel that this, this model has been validated. And as I said, uh, we, the idea is that we would leverage the homogeneity and the power of the Irish population. And I think having a, a project like this targeted on therapeutics gives us a good route to, uh, to develop and to see the, the value of this kind of research. We've all been involved in research where it's, it hasn't gone all the way. Uh, and at least uh, with, with this kind of model, if you, if you do discover something, uh, I think there's a good prospect of developing some drugs from this. So in terms, of, in terms of the Irish population, we have about 6 million on the island of Ireland, but there's an estimated 80 million of us around the world. So Irish people seem to have travelled far and wide. In terms of the relevance then, that if we do discover something within the Irish population, it's, it's roughly 1% of the global population, so it should be quite relevant uh, in terms of discovery. And most of the places that we've gone is, is really Western, the Western world, where most of the, uh, the therapeutics are designed for at the moment. In terms of genetics, uh, we see where the arrow is here. I don't have a pointer, but this, we, we don't, there's nothing unusual about the Irish population. Uh, slightly higher levels of homozygosity. Um, we have some groups that, that sit on the lower level here, the Irish travellers, who are a uh, consanguous population. Um, but aside from that, uh, th there's nothing that unusual about our population. So, in terms of heterogeneity, we all know that you know, diversity is a good thing. Um, but as a geneticist, uh, having a too diverse a population can confound uh, studies, particularly if you're doing genome-wide type of studies. And if you're looking at uh, complex diseases, um, mainly if you're looking at uh, variants where you have a small effect, this can also be a confounding fa factor. So uh, you would need very large uh, study populations in order to look for these variants, and even at that, we're probably unlikely, or we're probably likely to miss some of these rare variants or not identify them. So we think that Ireland is a rich source for uh, genomic research. Uh, we include Northern Ireland, which we're, we are collaborating with some groups there. The population of the island is 6.6 uh, .6 million. Uh, we are less homog uh, homogeneous than the rest of the Western population, <coughs> and we uh, are representative of global populations. So we think there's significant numbers of people with uh, many medical conditions, or most medical conditions, in Ireland uh, to be able to carry out this type of a study. And uh, with a population like that, we think we have a greater uh, discovery pop uh, potential um, particularly if you're looking at rare variants contributing to complex diseases. So the, the longer term vision is, uh, if you look at the, this is minor alley of frequencies, so if you look at um, common, uh, low frequency and rare variants, uh, we think there's a tipping point so that when we get into the 100,000 plus genomes in an Irish population, probably about uh, 600, somewhere between four and 600,000 genomes, we've essentially captured all of the variation within the Irish population. So our aim is to get beyond this tipping point to essentially capture all of the variation within the Irish population. And we think that this will put us in a, in a different uh, place to carry out genomics. Long-term view, and uh, this is expensive, uh, integrative omics or layered data sets. Uh, we are collecting uh, for, for a lot of these. We do not have the money to carry out all of these. So we are doing some kind of vertical studies on certain diseases to look at uh, things like metabolome, microbiome, epigenetics, expression, etc., and layer these data sets. And I think this is where the future of uh, omics will go uh, when we start to delve more deeply into different diseases. So a little bit about our approach. Uh, we have a, a series of areas that we're looking at. Um, oncology, uh, we won't talk, talk about that too much today. 
uh, but we do have one major project on brain tumours uh, in uh, the oncology region and a few other minor projects. Um, several autoimmune uh, diseases, neurology, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, also rare diseases in my area, um, my background, and controls. So in terms of neurology, uh, we're looking at things like um, uh, autism, uh, epilepsy, developmental disease, and we also are about to kick off a large Alzheimer's project. So the size of most of these projects uh, range from, or the aim for most of these projects is six to 10,000 uh, cases of uh, affected individuals, and then to power those uh, with 3x controls, so anything from 18,000 controls upwards. In terms of the control population, we have a large sports, uh, we call Genofit uh, project, where we're collecting uh, healthy controls, and a proportion of those are um, 70 years plus. Uh, unusually, uh, we've we found that we've got a lot of people in that range that, that we didn't expect. So we carry out uh, a cognitive uh, battery of tests along with these, uh, with the. Uh, sports uh, um, markers that we use, and uh, we think that these will act as super controls, particularly when we're looking at things like Alzheimer's. Uh, rare diseases also, uh, we, can <coughs> excuse me, we can use some of the parents as controls in this case. <coughs> so we have a, uh, a multi-omics approach, and um, we are also collecting as much as possible deep uh, clinical uh, data, so longitudinal and, uh, uh, and as much relevance to the particular disease that we're interested in. We also collect a, a lifestyle questionnaire. We have a structural workforce uh, flow, and we have a, uh, analytical tools and uh, capability for handling big data. So just to delve uh, a little bit more into that, in terms of multi-omics, uh, we are collecting samples, um, so we are uh, biobanking samples uh, for, for all of these uh, where possible, um, although we're not carrying out a lot of these uh, analysis at present. So currently we're just doing uh, SNP genotyping, which is uh, the PMM, PMRA array, and also whole genome sequencing. In terms of uh, phenotyping, uh, we collaborate with the clinical community to develop uh, what is the best phenotype to collect around each uh, different condition, and also to delve into uh, longitudinal data, so collecting uh, previous data and also uh, looking at uh, collecting data over the course of the project or uh, longer term where it's possible. And again, we also collect a health and lifestyle uh, uh, data set, uh, mainly for controls, but also uh, just to elim eliminate um, uh, possible con confounding uh, uh, lifestyle uh, aspects. Uh, we have a scalable uh, workflow, so we can scale this up uh, fairly quick. Uh, we, we're, we're building to, to scale a, uh, uh, for a national project, so we've, we put in the infrastructure for a lot of this. And also we have a rigorous uh, data protection and informed consent uh, uh, regime. So in, in Ireland, ethics is it's, it's not like the UK. Um, each individual hospital or institution has their own ethics boards. And it's a bit of a, uh, a nightmare to try and get all this to come together at a national ne level. So you've got to choose the right uh, ethics board to, to go to first and then try and build that out so that you have consistency across uh, all ethics boards and all studies uh, within the islands. Uh, in terms of data protection, uh, we're data protecting, protection compliance. We're also doing research into uh, um, encryption. So we have a system where we doubly encrypt the, the patient identifiers, but currently we're also looking at ways of encrypting the DNA sequence and seeing if we can actually interrogate the encrypted sequence uh, in its encrypted state. Where we are to date, uh, again, this is slightly out of date, but we have over 45,000 uh, ethics approvals, and we're over the 3,000 mark in terms of whole genome sequence. 
Uh, we have probably about 6,000 in terms of SNP genotyping at the moment. And we have a proprietary uh, clinical uh, data capture system that we developed in-house. So the model is to, is to build it around collabor collaborative research. Uh, the idea is that we would uh, engage with the clinical community, uh, that, that's would, that there would be a payback in terms of uh, research, hopefully uh, identifying uh, uh, drug targets, and also uh, the next generation of uh, uh, patient care. So in terms of this model, uh, the aim is to build a database, and that, that database would be interrogatable uh, in terms of these uh, research uh, areas. So we'd set up committees, uh, kind of a research steering committee around each disease that we, we get uh, involved in. Uh, so that's interrogatable from that committee. Uh, so we can ask questions and go back to the, the data or collect more longitudinal data if that's necessary. Uh, there's also the possibility, although it's early days, of having investigator-led uh, research studies. And eventually to have uh, clinical research studies uh, where we can uh, have clinical questions that we can go back to the database. Uh, the red box here is an idea that, <coughs> that we came up with in terms of with talking to P3G. Uh, we don't think that a company should be the, the gatekeeper here, nor the healthcare system, and that there should be uh, an indiv individual group that adjudicates on what uh, results go back to patients. So currently in Ireland, the, uh, the standard is that most information does not go back to patients or even clinicians. Uh, we, uh, we tend to take the European Society of Human Genetics um, guidelines very seriously. Uh, although we can we're, we're seeing a change in terms of attitudes, so some clinicians are starting to ask for that information to go back to, at least to them, and possibly to patients. Um, so you can see that there will be a change. Um, things like the ACMG uh, markers, uh, where they, they may wish to, to have that information for the patients. Um, we're starting to get requests from some ethics committees that we can include that. So our, our aim is, first of all, that we didn't become the barrier to, to having that information going back, but also that there would be some kind of a gatekeeper that would adjudicate on what information should go back to patients. And uh, we, we're seeing this happening uh, kind of um, naturally. There's a group have come together now of clinical geneticists, um, uh, genetic counsellors and researchers who are starting to adjudicate and give information or give advice back to clinicians on research findings. Uh, we've recently opened uh, south of Dublin, just on the outskirts, a place called Cherrywood. We've opened the facility there. Uh, we have a 10,000 square foot um, genome centre and uh, some of the Illumina folks have uh, been out to visit. Uh, if any of you are in, in Dublin, you're very welcome to visit. So just give you a few study examples, uh, just to uh, give you a flavour of what's, what's going on. Um, so this is an example of a, a rare disease. Uh, this is a, uh, this little cute guy here. Uh, he and his family, they, just, they suffered uh, inf infantile liver failure uh, for the first year of life, or if they got any kind of a, uh, a challenge, an immune challenge, they also went into liver failure. And it turns out when they do a liver biopsy, they have uh, um, abnormal livers. Originally, it was thought to be a mitochondrial condition. Uh, we carried out analysis on this uh, large pedigree, and we identified a region, uh, sequenced this, and we found a, a change in a gene called LARS. It turns out that this gene is a tRNA transferase. So when your immune system is under threat, uh, one of the amino acids that you need uh, most is codified by this gene. So this is the point where you expect me to, to tell you about the drug that we developed. Unfortunately, there was uh, prior uh, knowledge or prior art in this area. And uh, it turns out that when you have liver failure uh, or, or liver uh, challenge like this, this the standard um, uh, medical approach is to put these on a starvation diet. 
Um, one of our clinicians uh, noticed this, and um, by putting these children on a high protein diet, it turns out that you could prevent most of the, the liver failure. So having knowledge of what, what the process is, what the gene is, the mutation, uh, can lead to um, uh, healthcare changes. And now, uh, when we sequence these individuals <coughs> and identify that they have a mutation, they're already put onto, as a preventative measure, onto a high protein diet. This is just an example of a common disease with a, an autoimmune disease that we uh, tested. Um, small numbers, um, but we're getting uh, high p-values, particularly around the HLA region. So we, we already expected these, but we didn't expect to see um, this kind of a response with such uh, small numbers. Um, so this gives us, you, know, you can see here, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11. This gives us very uh, good confidence that having the, uh, the approach or the approach of uh, testing a homogeneous uh, population will give us uh, some success in looking at common diseases. We're also building a, an Irish reference genome and the variant atlas. So uh, using uh, uh, two approaches, uh, a, a, an area that we were involved in before, I think called Ancestry Mapper, and also looking at fine structure. Um, if you look at the Irish population, uh, there have been some recent publications, uh, which I, I personally have been involved in. Um, you can divide out the population into sub-regions. And uh, interestingly, we have uh, four provinces in Ireland, but the ancient word for province is, is, is the, the same as five, Cúig. So we have, uh, you can see in the north, uh, we have uh, Ulster, Munster, Leinster and Connacht. There was an old province also in the central uh, region called Mead. Um, and by and large, the, the breakdown of the populations maps the ancient uh, provinces or the ancient kingdoms of Ireland. This becomes very important when you're studying certain diseases. So for instance, if you're looking at uh, MS, uh, we know that the rate of MS is twice uh, in the northwest as it is in the southeast, which is unusual for a, a small island. But uh, we think that this will become important when we're to, in terms of matching cases and controls when we're carrying out studies in, in, uh, in MS. So cur currently, uh, we're trying to anchor in terms of population. So we've, um, uh, particularly from our sports cohort, we've, we've managed to anchor uh, n a number of individuals where we have uh, information that their par parents and grandparents also came from the same region. So uh, we're trying to get more granularity in terms of looking at the, the, the population. And uh, hopefully we will be able to divide this, this out in terms of haplotypes uh, much, with much more uh, detail in the future. Uh, and uh, to your, your right here, we also have a traveller population. These are contiguous uh, population, about just less than 1% of the, the Irish population. Uh, not only are they contiguous, they, they have a clan system and they tend to intermarry within their, their own clan system. There's over a hundred uh, private diseases uh, within this community. So uh, we've also been carrying out a, a lot of research in, uh, in that area. In terms of reference genomes, uh, we've already started work on this. So the, the idea here is that we uh, combine uh, uh, different techniques, uh, the Illumina short read technique, we're also looking at uh, combining this with long reads, um, other uh, techniques such as optical mapping, uh, high C. Um, we've also been sequencing some chromosomes and also looking at uh, strand sequencing. So the idea is that we would uh, put these together and build a consensus, particularly around the subpopulations of Ireland eventually, so that we have a, a reference map uh, for, uh, for each of the subpopulations. And eventually, instead of just a, a linear map, we want to build a, 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 a genome graph around all of this variation. So in terms of benefit in Ireland, um, the idea is that we would create a, a knowledge base and an infrastructure in Ireland to attract and to develop uh, genomic uh, research. 
Uh, we think that this kind of project will posi position Ireland as a centre of excellence. And we also hope to create an environment where we can accelerate this type of work, uh, particularly in, in terms of drug discovery and new targets uh, for, for drug discovery. And eventually, I think that this will benefit uh, the Irish population directly in terms of discovery. So I talked to you a little bit about uh, GMI and uh, our, one of our investors, as I said, is the Irish government. The view is that, uh, that this will act as a building block uh, within, the, uh, within Ireland. Uh, you may know that Ireland is, uh, now hosts uh, 10 of the top 10 pharma. We also have a lot of the, uh, in terms of um, IT, we've got the Googles, Microsoft or whatever. So there's a view in Ireland as if we can attract things that we attract the, the whole industry uh, to Ireland. Um, we're also interested in precision medicine and from an academic point of view, um, we're looking at how can we accelerate precision medicine in Ireland. Uh, it's very hard to go from zero to uh, to, to anything uh, in terms of um, introducing something into the healthcare system, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, having uh, genomic medicine Ireland activity has changed the attitude. So uh, pre the previous attitude was a single gene, single mutation attitude. And now uh, some of our communities, particularly uh, my own university, uh, our hospitals are aligned in, in what we call academic uh, uh, groupings of hospitals, so the R and East Hospital Group, uh, we're looking at how do we in introduce some form of precision medicine within the hospital system where we can test everybody, uh, something like um, you know pharm pharmacogenomics or uh, some of the basic mutations that we know of. And this is, is gathering momentum where you know uh, in Northern Ireland also they're interested in this that we may actually develop a national project in terms of introducing precision medicine into Ireland. Obviously, this overlaps with the activities of GMI, and uh, if we can do this, uh, I think we will have a, uh, a, a very good impact in terms of what we can bring back to the Irish community. So in terms of the Ireland Eats Hospital Group, it's about a quarter of the Southern Ireland population, about one million. The Western Trust in, Ireland, in Northern Ireland is about half a million. Uh, we're also interested in uh, building what we call a genomic passport for precision medicine. So this is where we look at much more uh, deeply uh, phenotyped individuals and uh, do multi-omics on these individuals. So probably a smaller project. Uh, this is expensive to do uh, when you look at all omics and all phenotyping. But to develop a small project around each of the disease areas, or at least some of the major disease areas that we're looking at. So I think that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for, for having me and uh, I'm open to any questions. Hi. Julie Williams from Cardiff. Are there any financial constraints? Because you've got venture capitalists in there. Do, what do they hope to get out of this? Uh, I presume a profit at some point. Uh, it's hard to see where it's, I mean, therapeutics is a long-term goal, so um, they, they're in, in for the long haul, at least that, that's what they have told us. And having the Irish government as a VC in there is kind of our, yeah. our safety in terms of uh, that kind of approach. But that there's no restriction on um, what, who owns the data in terms of clinical Well, the, pa the patient owns their, their data, right. so if, if the patient wants to withdraw, and we, we have one withdrawal so far, um, it's an automatic process, so they can, you, you're not completely withdrawn if there's already an analysis, that analysis stands, but uh, you know, any subsequent analysis, uh, the patient is automatically removed from that. Oh, that's great, that's very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Because you've, I, I didn't catch how many people you'd sequenced so far, but, but how much better is your imputation of the Irish genome than the, if you use the general imputation that's available on the haplotype? I think that's a question that remains to be seen until you get to a certain point. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, it's hard to tell. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we can already see some 
some areas of the genome that uh, are, are imputed wrongly. Can you hear from that? Um, I have a question. The sequencing, do you select random people or do you target certain patient groups? So we're targeting certain disease groups. At the moment, we have uh, projects in MS, uh, IBD, Crohn's, colitis, um, just about to start Alzheimer's, and uh, spondylitis is, is the other one. And then the other areas are cancers, uh, two rare disease projects, and uh, one large brain tumor project that we're looking at. Uh, so the incidental findings, do you, you have a committee to report that back or how do you follow the ESEG for that? Well, we're, we're not reporting it back at the moment, but we are, I guess we're gearing ourselves up for a change in attitude and also in terms of what we might be required in the future. Joseph Rush, UKDRI. Just to, to come back on the on the data sharing question. I'm sure this must be part of the, of the ethics approval, and I, I'm, I was wondering how does uh, Genomics Ireland um, compare with UK Biobank and, and with GEL in terms of sharing, um, sharing data? I mean, the provision is there, um, but we, we haven't generated the data yet, you know, much data yet. Um, some areas obviously are tied up uh, with interest because of pharmaceutical overlap, but the rest, yes, yeah, we're, we're, we're open to sharing. Yeah. And would this be sharing raw data, sharing just uh, summary statistics? I'm just wondering um, how this compares with, uh, with the other um, you know, large-scale biobank-type data sets. Um, we, as I said, we haven't got there yet, so I, I don't need to be in strong policies either way, but uh, certainly open to, uh, to do that. In the answer will be yes. Are you also downloading other, for example, to follow Jose's question, are you downloading the UK Biobank, which will data, which of course, I mean, I'm a quarter Irish too. Yes, yeah. I mean, so, obviously there's a 30% overlap between UK and, yeah, and Ireland, so it's, it's an obvious thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're downloading that data as well, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if, we're one national project. Uh, I think we're doing it in a different way to a lot of other people. Um, but eventually, you've got to think that a lot of these projects have got to come together at some higher level and find a way of communicating. So we're, we are trying to set up both the, not just the data, but the way we analyze data, the platforms, in a way that will be compatible to some kind of you know, collaboration in the future. So the uh, genetic homogeneity is an uh, advantage, obviously, but um, there's also an environmental homogeneity, of course. Uh, and absolutely. No one grows up in the desert or there's mm. lots of shepherd's pie. So would, you, would it be interesting or feasible to add a project where you include Irish people who've moved away to different continents and do all the same analysis and gather a lot of phenotype information if you can? Mm -hmm. this might be we are, and then subtract out some environment and yeah. genetic pure? We are currently looking at, I mean, as I said, there's a, a huge diaspora and a large population, population. So we are currently looking at uh, projects which uh, look at both uh, people who have Irish ancestry, but also Irish people who mo moved abroad in the past 15, 20 years. Uh, in terms of homogeneity, not just the, the genetic homogeneity, in terms of healthcare system, we're pretty homo homogeneous also in terms of lifestyle and culture. So I think there's, there's kind of an added advantage there and uh, that's we, we ourselves probably don't always realize, but uh, there isn't, uh, you know, you don't get great disparity in, in Ireland in terms of healthcare. Uh, uh, the same as the UK, but you know, unlike the US, where you see you do see extremes. So, uh, I, th I think that will add to um, yeah, our, our study. Most uh, individuals tend to stay with the same clinician for a lifetime. So it's. Uh, Although we don't have uh, healthcare records, uh, electronic healthcare records, uh, most of the data tends to reside in you know the one location. Yeah. 
course, I, and I state this as someone with Irish ancestry, so it's not meant in any. But of course, there's a history of very large families, and does and are you using that at all in your um, in your sampling process? Um, so. <laughs> There are DP, data protection issues with some, some of that. Uh, with rare diseases, yes. And what we've, we've, we've done with certain conditions, we will go after large pedigrees as a kind of a subset of that project. Uh, we can't just go out and ask everybody, you know, who's, who's affected in their families. Uh, Ireland's a small place. Coming to the question of John also, is uh, you have Decode uh, helping you a little bit, right? So did you try to do some imputation of your sequences uh, in those which you do, uh, did the uh, chip, chip arraying on? Because that's one of the strengths that Decode did, right? With uh, Overcome. Well, let's say we're looking at us uh, imputing uh, from, the, from the SNP data. Um, it's, it's early days, yes. The other thing I said is that we're looking at uh, chromosome sequencing. So yeah. uh, the one thing that Decode had was, you know, historical records going back, uh, I don't know, 16th century or something. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, most records in Ireland were destroyed in 1922 during the Civil War. So uh, conveniently, there are no records. Um, so we, we hope that we can reconstruct some data if we can sequence at a chromosome level a certain uh, group of um, haplotypes, as, as it were, from, from that data. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.